Hello, hello. There he is, Jeff. Yeah. First time at Google LAX, yeah? It is. This is cool. I've been to a few Google places and they're always mind-blowing how different it is from anywhere else. We just got him a wellness shot. Cayenne, cayenne yeah. pepper. Was I, was, I was dragging. I'm popping now. Well, you've been, you've been on a promotional tear. I've been yeah. like the past week or so. Can you, can you get everyone up to speed? Well, yeah. No, I mean, normally if you have a TV show, you know, you go and you do press and you promote. And we've been on so long that the publicist who's here somewhere, Lori, I, I hate doing it typically because I just, I don't know. I just reached a point where I was like, I don't really want, there's this pressure. You sit down to do like Kelly and Ryan and you already feel the clock because I, and I've done a daytime talk show. Wow. What a year that was, but you feel the, you know, you have three minutes and then so quickly your pace changes. Like, well, so then what happened was the dog ran yeah. up and then he got hit by the car and well, some other <laughs> stuff happened. So I always feel that pressure, but for 40, I felt, you know, I felt this pride and like, we worked really hard on this season. We just come off of your season and, yeah. and, uh, so it's felt good. It's been really fun to talk about it. Yeah. Well, it's a bit serendipitous that we have you here in LA because for everyone who doesn't know, I'm Googler in New York City. Um, and we were attempting to get him out there and he was just there for Jimmy Fallon, right. Elvis Duran show, whatever. Um, and you had, as far as I know, all of Monday, February 3rd blocked off and uh, afternoon time on February 4th. And our friggin' team at Google couldn't find a room to take him. <laughs> so really? I, so I pushed it. I was like, but we got to do it. Like, how can we do it? And they're like, well, we have how a room in LA. How does that happen? I don't know. I don't know. But hey, now we got everyone here. So yeah. that's cool. Great. Thanks for coming out. This is the last um, interview I'm doing before we premiere tonight. So that's it's really last. cool. And I get a layback with you and it's casual and yeah. chill. And there we go. Yeah. DK Chilling. Oh my God. <laughs> if not for that, you might have won. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. Um, so, everybody, we're going to go, we're going to take it way back to 2000. Um, we're going to ask Jeff a couple of questions about how it all started, how it all began. Um, we're then going to fast forward to season 40, what we can expect for tonight's premiere. Okay. Um, in the middle, we're going to get to know Jeff, his hot takes, his preferences on Survivor and Non Survivor. Um, and we got some special clips as well. Oh, um, nice. Now, as far as I know, and this is my experience, I don't know the same for you, but like a lot of my, I feel like Survivor fans come in two camps. We have the super, super fans who bring their mom and sit front row. Um, we already and, met. <laughs> and then we have folks like my friends who are like, wait, that show is still on. Yeah. Um, so before we get started, I want to get everyone it's in It's a great, right? you're right, it's exactly it. Yeah. Um, why, first, I guess, why is that? Like. Well, I think because Survivor is so, like you said, I mean, I meet Katie's mom and, and who is Emily? Coworker. Coworker. Okay. <laughs> so I meet them and they're fans. And if you're a fan of Survivor, you probably don't miss many episodes and you want, tend to watch them on Wednesday nights. Maybe not. You don't want people to talk during the episode because you know it's, there's these yeah. little things that are happening. But then I find myself talking in a, like a group of friends and there'll be one new person and, the, and they're looking at us like we're like, this is bizarre. And then I always feel compelled to say, if you don't watch Survivor, please don't feel weird yeah. because I'm on it. It's not a big deal, but just know that if you're in it, you're kind of in it. There's no cold, lukewarm. Yeah. You're either. And my hope is this season is that there's one new family that finds it because you know, Kids, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 yeah. year old kids, man, they just, they explode with this idea of, oh my God, that's possible. I could go in a jungle and we're in casting right now. And I'd say 70% of the people under 35 walk in and they say, been watching since I was six, been watching <laughs> since I was eight. My dad first turned me on when I was seven. And here they are auditioning because we've been on so long. Yeah, I've, I've met a lot of folks like that. In fact, one friend of mine, not a six or seven year old, um, but she watched for the first time my season. She felt obligated. Since the uh, finale, which was December 18th, yeah. she's watched five seasons and already applied. Really? Yeah. Morgan, wow. check her out. I think she'd be good. <laughs> well, get up, make sure we, you know. I, I reached out to Caitlin, my casting lady. Okay. I, I remember a lot about that first season because it was still to this day the coolest thing that I've, that's ever happened to me. And, and you look the same. 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> so at that time, that was like crazy, right? First of its kind. Like, yeah. How, how did this all begin, and how did you get involved in it? Well, how it all began. The original format of Survivor was uh, started in the UK, and this guy Charlie Parsons. And I'm pretty sure it was a four-day experiment for a local morning talk show where he just took, I think it was two or three couples and put them on an island for a few days. And that was sort of the seeds of this idea of like, oh, maybe you could do this. And then it was kind of based on this game, um, Screw Your Neighbor, which was you make alliances with people in the game and then you pick various points in which you try to get rid of them, hoping they don't get rid of you before you get rid of them. That was the basic, very basic premise. And they did a season in Sweden and it was a massive hit was very different from our show in that it was a tiny budget, had no fire, they couldn't shoot at night. Mark took Survivor and Mark Burnett took Survivor and blew it up. And what was cool about that summer was that I had moved from New York to LA and was, I really wanted to do something that had storytelling in it. And all the stuff I was getting offered was like dating shows where you read a prompter and say, this next couple hopes that they'll find a house. That, I, can't, <laughs> I can't, I was like, I can't do it. And so I kept turning down these jobs and I had no money left. And, and then, and I literally heard Mark on the radio one day driving down the 405 and thought, oh my God, it's called Survivor. That's, that's what I'm meant for. And I wanted it. And then I went in and met with him. I was lucky enough to get a meeting and didn't go that well. He talked for a long time and then I talked for like three minutes and I thought I was so, I, I remember I had a picture and resume, you know, like I was auditioning. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do. He didn't care. So I went, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a studio guy. I'm a student of the human condition. I'm a writer. I've been in therapy. I get this show. And he, did, <laughs> he literally goes, hmm, very nice to meet you. <laughs> okay. The door was right over there. Okay, great. <laughs> he did. And I left and I'm not exaggerating when I say I, went home and went, who else could do this but me? And I knew every other person that was sort of did what I did. It was, there wasn't really host. It was more just like personality storytellers. I didn't hear from him for months. And I thought, man, I guess my rate, I was just way off because I thought for sure I was meant for it. And then I ultimately ended up getting a call and, and got it. Yeah. S sounds similar to mine. Yeah. I, um, so I submitted my tape. This was September, 2018. Um, heard back from Caitlin, the casting lady that in the same night. I didn't even expect to hear back, I heard back. And then she had so much urgency, we need to get on the phone when you're free tomorrow, this right. and that. She ended up ghosting me for three weeks. I was cold calling her, leaving her voicemails, this and that. And she finally just called me back on a random Wednesday night. It was like, hey Dean, we really like you. Like, can we get you, can we interview and stuff? So I know the feeling. Well, and I will say, and maybe this is what happened with me as well. In our world, three weeks is, you know, it's a blank. Yeah, yeah. Like we, they see you or they say, hey, we met this guy in New York. He might be good. I wouldn't then hear about you again for a yeah. month. And yeah. then, when but I do remember, I do recognize those pants. I wore these on purpose. Tell them about it. <laughs> he came in with more swagger than <laughs> most anyone has come in. So much swagger that for real, there was a few people in the room going, they said a few things. They're like, nah, he's, he's just got too much. He thinks he's all this and he thinks he's Mr. Google. And I, he's like, I'm a very persuasive person at my job. You should see the way. I, and I go, who the fuck wears these? Well, no, he, he asked, he asked, where do I get a pair of those? And do you think I could pull on them off? And I think I said no, and that's what got us on the wrong footing. Uh, no, it was never on the wrong footing. No, okay. uh, no. but you're right. I did go home, and I, I and I asked our kids who are teenagers. I, I showed them these on, I think on Amazon. I found them. I said, "Hey, there was this guy in today. It was kind of cool. It's like a sweatpant, but it kind of looks like a dress pant." And they both look, they both looked at me like, "Are you high? You are way too old to wear something that we should be wearing, Dad." <laughs> But no, you were always in the mix. We just, part of the process is really to see beyond the psych tests we do or the medical tests or any of that stuff. It's also just to see what do you like? Yeah. What do you like if somebody pokes you in the chest, which is super annoying. Yeah. Some people get really annoyed. Some people don't seem to mind. You, you never deviated. This is what all my notes about you said. He's never not this guy. I don't know, I'm DK chilling, man. I'm fine. Exactly. Take me or leave me. I don't care. <laughs> That's exactly how it is, though. So at the casting finale, right, you, you do a bunch of pre-screening calls and, and the Skype interviews. Then you get called to finals, which is a week in L.A. They put you in a hotel, and basically you're in the room working, doing your Google work, whatever. And then you get a call on the hotel phone, 
say, hey, come to suite XYZ. They mic you up before you, before you enter, go in the suite, and there's a chair like this with the green screen, lights and cameras already facing it. And then he's there with all the other producers and all these CBS, probably like 15 people in a hotel suite. And like the nerves just start it's going. It's pretty intimidating. And so it I is. just, my, com my comfort position is just like, what's up guys, how are you? And then like the energy takes over. But yeah, the cross leg is, is a signature. Everyone saw it at Tribal Council too. Yes. Yeah. Um, back to season one. Yeah. Um, you get the gig. Yeah. What do you think would happen? You thought you'd be here at 40 or what were your initial No, I, um, I remember going on, I was the last person hired and we got there and Mark said, well, what are you gonna wear? And he had these shirts that CBS had designed and they literally had the CBS insignia with the, this eyeball and CBS right here. And here it said CBS and here it said CBS. And, and I, I, was, I just went, oh man, I just don't, that's not what I'm seeing. This feels like I'm a sports announcer. Uh, what do you want to wear? I go, just normal, like normal clothes, like a normal person. So we were in Malaysia and we go to this clothing store and the only thing they have are these giant shirts and shorts. Mm -hmm. And if you like, if you really go watch season one, my clothes look like four people, my dad could have worn them. <laughs> and, but the, the night I really remember zone or like cluing in on it was I'd been there one day and we'd kind of been walking around and he was sort of explaining more of the show to me. And then he said, they're gonna run a tribal council tonight. We're gonna go check it out. They're, gonna, they're building the set. And we showed up and there was a guy there, Barry, who was running tribal, like pr practicing a Q&A and testing lighting and where the flame's gonna be. And, and Mark said, let's go watch him and see what he's doing. And I had some instinct and I said, I don't wanna see anybody do it. I, I, this is like birthing something new. You hired me, brother, just let me birth it with you. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'll always be mocking him for the, ne the rest of my career. And I knew he was uncertain because he had that look like, oh my God, you're that guy. You're the guy that can't, you know, but he let me go in the same way that he wanted to put an earpiece in my ear so that he could talk to me during tribal and say, ask Dean this question. Like do they have, do. Do you not have that? No. Wow. I, and, I assumed you had it the whole time. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, the questions he asks are so pointed, right? And like, I feel like you could see us like tap Tommy on the knee and like you're asking all these it's, it's well, impressive. It's very impressive. Well, thanks. But, yeah. you know, I think it's because of the imbalance of power. I don't have anything at stake. True. You know, yeah. so I'm always aware that when I, like, I'm not looking to cause any trouble at Tribal. I'm just looking to ask questions. <laughs> no, leading, really. Leading questions. Yes, but meaning, like, I'm just saying I don't come in with an agenda to cause problems. I come in with an agenda to get the story. Mm -hmm. And I do notice people. It's amazing how many people still roll their eyes. They can't stop it because you hear something that's annoying, and you're like, yeah. And I'm like, what's wrong? Oh, that's just, it's just the dumbest thing. That you, <laughs> you just said that. And then I'm like, oh, no. Nah. Now we're going. <laughs> All you need is Nora, a little dash of Nora in there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Nora always helps. Uh, <laughs> um, so an iconic first season, obviously. I just heard the other night, the finale had 52 million viewers. 72. 72 million viewers. For reference, the Oscars on Sunday had 24 million. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That was a f uh, crazy phenomenon. Yeah. I uh, went to New York after the finale for something maybe to do an interview or something. And, and uh, people, several people told me the same story. They said, you should have been here. That night of the finale, everybody in, in Manhattan had their windows open and you could hear from the street people groaning when Richard was declared the winner. It was that big of a like shared yeah. moment. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you know, like, did you need the viewers, the ratings as validation or was there perhaps a moment on the island when you were filming where you're like, this is gonna be something? Well, okay, there is a story that I can't, I don't know if we've ever really told this story or not, but I'll make it short. We were trying to figure out the show and part of the show was going to be reward challenges and the reward challenge was, challenges were to incentivize you to play harder because you could finally get something to eat or a cushion or whatever. But we hadn't figured out that they needed to escalate you know, like the hierarchy of needs, you can't give somebody a steak and then the next time give them a piece of bread. They're like, but I already had a steak. But we didn't, we hadn't, it seemed so simple, but we hadn't figured that out. And we had done some rewards, rewards. And there was a sponsor, there were several sponsors that season, which is how Mark sold the show. Every network had said no, nobody's interested in this, this idea of abandoning people. And Mark, <laughs> nobody, every network passed. It's a famous story. 
in Hollywood because of the success of the show. But Mark then went out to sponsors like Target and Budweiser and Shoals inserts. And every week he would hand me a new product. He's like, all right, it's a shoe insert, Jeff. And, and, and you know, think about it. It'd be really nice to have a cushion in your shoe right now, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think it was Budweiser, the beer company was there. And, and they were, so the, the prize was going to be one cold beer. That was the prize. And we thought, that sounds pretty cool. Because we were always trying to like, it's not a, a chocolate bar. It's one piece of chocolate. It's not a six pack. It's one beer. And you have to. And so word gets the tree mail gets to the tribes. They read it. And Richard Hatch says, basically, a beer? Let's just don't do it. Let's just tell them. Let's show up and say, we're not going to do it. We want something <laughs> else. He was holding us hostage. It was a beautiful leveraged move by him. <laughs> but um, Mark, so word got back to us, just so you know, we're heading, we're getting in the boat. And when we get there, they're not going to participate. They're going to say they want something else. So Mark huddles all of us. And as he's talking to us, all of the sponsor, the Bud Light, the Budweiser people, I remember this woman dressed in pure white. And it, the jungles are muddy. She's got mud all over here. And I know she's like, this is not what you thought this was going to be. But they're coming in and Mark says, you know, if they weren't here right now, I would, I would go back to the players and say, I, I challenge you because we'll just end the show right now. He was that kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But he said, I, I made a promise. I made a contract. I have a commitment. We have to put the beer. So we huddled around. We have a mutiny about to happen. We have the sponsors coming to see their beer. The contestants don't want their beer. And then John Kerhofer, one of the only or other original guys, Mark said, we need an idea. And John said, you know, there's this thing on, I think, TBS or TNT called Dinner and a Movie. What if we make it dinner, like cold beer? And, and Mark goes, I got it. Okay, this is what it is. Jeff, when they get here, you tell them a cold beer. You wait for Richard to bite. And then you say, I wasn't finished. It's a cold beer and as much spaghetti as you can eat while you watch the first 15 minutes of the show you were starring in. Wow. And it worked, Richard, everybody was like, oh my God, Richard, you're such an idiot. This is a great <laughs> reward. <laughs> but we didn't have 15 minutes cut yet and we didn't have anywhere to do it. So while all of this is happening simultaneously with a crew of 85, we go back to our base camp and our production designer, Kelly, changed our base camp and she just quickly established what looked like a local Malaysian bar. And we brought in a couple of fo foosball tables. We brought in a bunch of locals. We told them to start smoking and, and for real. And it, I, I haven't watched it in years. I should probably go look at it. But I remember looking out at it going, if you didn't know better, you wouldn't, you would not think anything of this. And we had blinds so the cameras could shoot through it. Then I'm on a boat with the woman who won, Kelly, and we're, she's blindfolded and we're driving her around. This is no exaggeration. We're just driving her around in the same circle, <laughs> waiting for it to get finished. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the only season that we had had editors on location. And so Mark, they had been cutting stuff because you know, you're building the show. So Mark wanted to look at footage and say, so if it's an interview and then we cut to this, and then we go to a challenge. What else will we need here? Oh, we'll need an interview here. So we were kind of putting the show together. And he said, look, I need 15 minutes. You need some graphics, put their name on there. And so Kelly and I sat down with a bowl of spaghetti, cold beer, sponsors are happy. And they project the first 15 minutes and all of the crew that's pretending to be people on vacation or whatever, we are all looking at it going, oh my God, it's really cool. Because if you go back and think 20 years ago, there was nothing like that. What was Standing that? What on a boat it? saying they're going to jump off and be yeah. in the water. And so it, that was the moment where I went, I don't know if anyone will watch it or anyone will like it, but I know this is really cool. Cool. It's really cool. Nice Long story. story. First time telling it. I don't know Public if it's a first. I've told it. I just don't think I've ever seen anybody talk about it. And I think it's so like such a That's significant awesome. moment. Awesome. So 20 years, I Googled average lifespan of a TV show. Mm. It said seven years, which wow. I think is generous. Right. Why, what, it, what makes Survivor so special? Probably the format. I mean, it really is a really simple idea. You yeah. take a group of strangers 
and you do two things. You force them to rely on each other to survive and you force them to vote each other out to move forward. Mm -hmm. And then everything else that happens in that box, like you guys, I'm sure in your different departments, you have this on one level, it's a constraint. This is what Google does, but we can do anything within that box that we want. And that's how I look at it. We have a very simple thing. And then I think the other half, and this is me uh, patting ourselves on the back a little bit, is we work really hard to try to reinvent the show every single time. And it, it takes months and months to try to figure out that one little new nugget of something. And that's why when people cherry pick and they're like, yeah, didn't really like Edge of Extinction. I feel like, you know, like, well, dude, I get it. Do you have an idea? Because <laughs> I would love it. I heard, uh, I don't know if anyone watched the Jimmy Fallon um, show with Jeff, but I heard a funny story there, how he emailed you an yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to retell that one or in general, like where do the ideas come from? Just laying in bed in the shower? And you... um, well, if they're, if they're not coming from Fallon, I mean, Jimmy writes the, the like 3 a.m. emails and it will be, it'll say in the subject line, here's one. And then about 20 minutes later, don't read the first one, read this one. <laughs> it does that. But so, he, so for everyone who doesn't know, he actually um, <laughs> suggested the one on my season in yep. which Rob and Sandra were in the boxes at Tribal Council. Um, and it's funny, we actually as a cast had no idea we were there. I love that. Until we watched it uh, in September. Love that. Yeah. If you don't know, the basic thing is that Tribal Council is where the climax of the show happens and people are voted out. And the players can see everything. They're looking at me and... Fallon, a year before your season, had wrote, written me and said, wouldn't it be great if somebody could eavesdrop? So I went to location and Tribal was already being built and there was just no way to pull it off. So for the next year, I was talking to our art guys and I said, let's build it. We'll have Rob and Sandra. Mm -hmm. So they started the entire Tribal Council from this one tiny little area so that we could put every eye line based on that. So that was a Fallon idea. It was also Fallon's idea to do a live vote like second chances where we let the audience do a live vote. But ideas for me just come from my own personal, it's why it's so singular in that I liked Edge of Extinction, not simply because it lets you keep popular people in the game longer, which is just a producing idea, yeah. but I like the idea of how far will you go to push yourself to see what you're capable of as a human. I don't, I don't know how they did it. I don't I, either. I, it's, I, was, I was there. And I, every time you would see clouds in the sky, I'd be like, I, to be honest, I, I said to myself many times, I want to be at work right now. With our MKs and our free food, I literally wanted to be at work. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to be home with my family. I wanted to be at work with free food. And well, and there was, a, there was a woman, Reem, who was on her tribe and she was a mom and she was being too much of a mom. And so here's this nice woman who's just trying to do her best. And nine people are saying, you're driving me nuts, hanging up my clothes, telling me to eat more. Just stop talking. Yeah. And they vote her out. Nine one. Horrible. She goes to Edge of Extinction. She gets on a boat. She gets in the ocean. It's pitch black. It's a real ocean. There's no help. There's no light. There's no support. She's alone. Nobody's talking to her. She has a torch. But she doesn't know that we've engineered the torch to go out between 20 to 30 minutes because you're not going to have fire. You're going to have enough fire to get you there. And the only reason you have fire to get you there is so that we can have a shot. So the fire lights her face and allows <laughs> us to shoot her as she gets on the beach. And then she gets there, fire goes out, rain comes down. And her last words are, I don't know if I can do this. 33 days later, she had done it. To me, that was exactly what I pitched to CBS was, what if we had a spiritual death and rebirth? How cool would that be? But then I talked to a lot of Survivor fans. They're like, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I just say when you're out, you're out. Yeah. Enough with your spiritual stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so everyone knows, like, it's real. Like, I thought going out there, I was there would be, like, a granola bar, like, that the camera really? would give you. Yeah, I did think that, yeah. Some people asked me, wait, there wasn't showers or toothpaste? Like, it's really real. Like, do Which you guys, says do you, a lot about how you kept your hair, because your hair was always looking was pretty the, good. I think it was the, the salt water, like, the salty air. You know, I think that has something to do with it. Um, do you guys feel bad for us? No. No? <laughs> We, we signed up. We signed up. But you know, it really, the reason is, is because nobody signs up that doesn't want this. There was a part of you that wanted it. I know you're a competitor in athletics anyway, but this is more than just sports. It's yeah. more than running a challenge. You really are sleeping with rats and spiders and snakes in the rain with people you don't like who want to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. You have no one you can trust. There's not a single bit of comfort. There's, you've been deprived of everything. 
your, your basic needs. I need some water. I need a little rice and I need to like get my mental cause I'm losing my mind. I, when I see you guys down, even though I might ache as a human, I'm excited as a human because you, you can do it. Yeah. No, it was, I, I'd still say to this day, most challenging thing I've ever done in my life mentally, physically. Yeah. I don't think you can understand that until you've played. Yeah. I you could watch at home. Even me, I'm out there and I'm exhausted when we're done producing two seasons. I'm out, I'm out of gas. And then I see you guys and I'm like, oh my God, I've been eating and sleeping. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Um, we're going to pivot a little. Okay. And get to know you. Some hot takes, as we like to call them. Some preferences of yours. Okay. Um, not meant to be like super quick answers, but um, if we have a story, we can go there. Because it's a great one so far. Um, but yeah, we're going to do a little survivor, a little personal. Okay. First one, who, given um, the huge Rob and Sandra statues, which are reminiscent of our the Mount Rushmore, right? who is your Mount Rushmore of Survivor? And that, that's four people. Oh, oh okay. Um, man, that's good. I, I hate being put on the spot like this. I guess, uh, well, so you're saying we have Rob and Sandra, there are two of them? We'll take them. Okay. Oh, man, really? Uh, I guess I'd give one to, I need two heroes. I'll pick Ben. And uh, really, uh, I, uh, I got to go Parvati. <laughs> What's it? Parvati. Um, That's not really two heroes. It's basically three villains and a hero. Yeah. Okay. Um, your go-to karaoke song. It's a good question. Been changing it lately. I love Van Halen because it's in my range. Um, but <laughs> I've been getting into a little more Eminem, so I think it might be, uh, wait, I'm not, just so we're clear, I'm not about to, um, oh, no. be, okay, I thought you were going to suck audio, me ready? into karaoke. I'd say, uh, lose yourself. There we go. We just listened to it. Yeah. Backstage, getting fired up. We were chest pumping and everything. Yeah. Just kidding. We weren't. Uh, 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 how can you not like that song? Oh, no, it's amazing. Come on. Amazing. Lose yourself in the music, the moment. Mm -hmm. Never let it go. You only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. This opportunity him, comes him, in a lifetime. Not to, not to put you down, but I asked him, uh, what song should we play to get pumped up right now? He goes, the one by Eminem, one shot. I was like, you know, it's Lose Yourself, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, yeah. and do you know what was going through my head actually was Hamilton. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Which I almost picked, but then I knew you'd really dog me <laughs> if I said, I'm going to go I with saw it. I saw it. I loved it. Loved it. Um, you have two children, six and 13. Would you allow them to play Survivor or do they want to play Survivor? 16 and 13. Is that what you said? 16 and 13. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think Survivor is amazing. Cool. Not a single person has played that hasn't left and said, never the same. I'll never be the I same. Uh, your favorite season ever? Okay. Truth? This one. 40. Yeah. And I've never... It's in a promo thing. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> this, is, this is the best season we've ever done. And, and the creative behind it was 20 winners... We'll introduce this new layer of money because at some point every society gets money. You stop bartering and trading chickens for rice and you just agree that this coin is gonna be this value and that's what we're gonna to use to buy and sell things. And so we introduce that, which starts tonight. You see the early seeds. They don't know what it means, but, and the last part of the creative was, let's give them enough weapons that they break the game that when, when this season's over, we just can't do it the same way again. Because I was getting, I was running out of ideas and it felt like we're, we're like so fast, let's just have them, let's just have them go until they, they literally kill each other. And that's what happens. It's relentless, starts tonight. There's a scene early on where Ben, ben is sitting in the jungle going, I can't believe I'm out here. I can't believe I'm with Rob. Rob at some point is gonna to try to get me to give him information and I'm terrified that he'll do it. Even though I know he's gonna do it, that paranoia goes for 39 days and when, the, when it's over and we get to final tribal and we have our final players, you can see in their face. It's like, you know, they just got out of uh, like 30 years in prison. They just have nothing left. And then in 41, we're going to birth something new, uh, you know, bring money into a bigger way and just try to maybe reset and start over. Cool. Uh, one we love at Google for like team icebreakers and stuff. Um, your first screen name. 
on AOL or AIM or something like that. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> uh, all right. It, it was Don't we do it all the time. Yeah? It was first draft 2002 at AOL.com. Nice. And it's, we, I've heard more embarrassing ones. Okay, yeah. but the fact that it's AOL is what my kids are like. You had an AOL? Are you AOL messaging right now, Dad? <laughs> really? Um, this was one I got asked on pregame when we were out there. Um, we got asked your favorite Jeffism. Mm. So for everyone who doesn't Bless know, you. these are the sayings that he repeats all the time, such as "the tribe has spoken," "survivors ready," um, things like that. Right. What is your favorite? Got nothing for you. <laughs> yeah. You know though. The great thing about getting this gig is that there was nobody before me. So yeah. none of this, it, it, none of it is pre-planned. The got nothing for you was just one day. It was just a comment, a kind of a lippy comment, but it really was just, I got nothing for you. Grab your stuff, go back. And then I guess the next time we thought I should say that again. And then it became a thing. But, and now it is fun because now you say things that, that players know you're going to say, even though they're ridiculously corny, yeah. I still say them. Nice. I heard a fun story about Travis Spoken, and that, that's Burke. Want to give us the Yeah. The, the, so when we were, uh, we still have a photo somewhere of a whiteboard, and we, were, we had walked through tribal council a couple of times, and we knew the beats that basically we were going to give them these torches, and then we would snuff the torch, and then they would leave, and that was it. But I kept feeling like the show uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was on, and Regis would always say, final answer? And everybody's walking around going, final answer. And so I was saying to the group of people I was working with, we need a final answer. Like, what's our final answer line? Because it's going to feel flat if they just walk off. And we were writing just ridiculous things. None of them made sense. They weren't memorable. They were always like, well, you should, I don't know, whatever. So we're getting ready for the first tribal. And Mark says, okay, you know, these are the beats. And I go, yeah, I just wish I had a line to say. I can't think of anything good. And he goes, what do you mean? I tell him, and he goes, oh, oh, here's what you say. You say, uh, well, obviously, your tribe don't want you around no more. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. And I, I go, well, yeah, I don't know, Mark. That doesn't really, he goes, uh, uh, Jeff, I don't know what to tell you. The tribe has spoken. That's the way it goes. And I went, oh my God, dude, that's it. The tribe has spoken. That's fantastic. And then we were at the museum of like, or the Hall of Fame of Television and Museum, some interview of importance in TV. And, and I'm sitting with Mark and the interviewer says, who came up with The Tribe of Spoken? And Mark turns to me and he goes, I don't remember, who did? I had that moment, I was like, oh my God, I could take it right now, just take it. <laughs> I had a little bird, just go, just grab it, just put your, open your hand, grab it and eat it. <laughs> did you take it? I didn't. Oh. You didn't pull a Dean taking the idol, Tommy and Colorblind? No. No, um, that, was, that was good. Yeah. Um, if you had a YouTube channel, yeah. non-survivor related, what would it be? Uh, man, if I had a YouTube channel, shit. Give me a second here. God, everything that's coming to me is so bougie. It's just all <laughs> it lame. Happens. I'm prejudging all of them. <laughs> uh, I know I have a good idea somewhere in here, Dean. I just don't know what it is. What would you pick for me? Hmm. I don't know you like too, too personally. To be yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't wear, have how to wear black thing. every day and make it look stylish. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> Better um, than I got. Cool. No cooking with Jeff to come. Um, <laughs> what survivor moment shocked you the most? If it were a blind side, uh, I think what shocked me the most, there was this, I don't know if anybody saw this season, Survivor Cambodia, or I think it was, or it was Koh Rong, but in Cambodia, we had a really hot day, an unusually hot day, and we were in the dirt, and we had these giant sand pits, and they were big. They were probably like, you know, half of this stage and deep, and we had hidden one flag, I think, somewhere straight down, and this one tribe just couldn't find it, and they're all digging, and they're all digging, and first one woman got sort of hyperventilated and she was she was in the sand and I asked her if she was okay and and then this Sydney this woman and then this um oh my gosh what's his name uh oh my god I can't believe his name most dramatic moment I can't remember his name anyway another guy they kept digging and then they 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 finally found the bag but just as the challenge was ending they both dropped and it was this really dramatic moment and Sydney is a weightlifter and super fit, beautiful body. She had 
she had stuff coming out of the side of her mouth, like just foam and juice and everything. And then the other guy was just out, completely out. And our medical team ran in and we broke the fourth wall and I was yelling things like, we need ice, we need coolers, we need umbrellas in it. It was super scary. And he was out for about 20 minutes and I was holding his head and our doctor was not even dealing with Sydney. He was looking at her saying, she's fine, he's not. And you know when they put that oxygen mask on and you always see the person go, <laughs> they put it on and nothing happened. And I remember thinking, well, that's such a lie on the movies when they show you that. <laughs> and, and he was sitting like that and I'm yelling for the helicopter. I'm looking at our safety team going, where is the helicopter? And Dr. Joe, he is just pumping things and vital signs and look, give me one of those blue things, put it in his nose, put this thing in his arm. And I'm just holding him and our director, Dave Dryden had this, he's a huge dude and he had this huge chunk of ice holding it on his chest, trying to lower his body temperature while he's saying, camera B, get a shot of the monitor and somebody tilt over to here, you know, <laughs> tilt up to, like we broke every wall. It was, forget the TV show. And then after almost 20 minutes, he went <laughs> and his whole face got big again. Like he was dying. And then later our doctor said, you know, you were panicking for the helicopter he was not ready to travel. He wasn't, he wasn't going to make it. And then everything's fine. And he actually came back and, and played again. But that was the scariest moment. Wow. It would have been better if I could remember his name. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you. Where were you? Like, <laughs> Caleb. That's Lori from CBS. I'm yelling at her. She's the only loyal, li reliable partner in here. <laughs> Um, on a lighter note, and this is the last question for our hot take portion okay. before we get to season 40, and then some questions from you guys. Um, am I going to get asked back? Possibly. Right. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. It, we don't care how deep somebody goes in the game. I mean, if you go deep, it's great because you had more episodes and people might remember you. We're really only interested in how people play. That's it. Like, you had somebody on your season, Chelsea, who continues to beat herself up because she was out early. But in our eyes, she's a player. She went, she looked for idols. She tried to make big moves. You have to play as though you're going to lose because you're probably going to lose. Yeah. You made it to the end. That rarely happens. You actually had a shot to win. Some people think you should have won. Had you had a jury of the public, I think you would have won. That's what I hear. So you're a player and you have swagger. Thank you. So you're, yeah. And, and the fact that you said thank you is even more interesting because some people might go, oh, well, wait, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You embrace it. You're like, I do have swagger. I'm fucking DK chilling. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm DK chilling. And, and I've got this bag of tricks and I got this nifty little thing and I got this piece of jewelry. <laughs> so yeah, you would, be, you would be on our list. Cool. Um, let's take it to season 40. We're gonna give you guys a special clip from tonight's episode. Um, we're oh, gonna give cool. take, take your takes, which is a hot one, real quick. Okay. Um, and then I want to save like ten minutes for questions, so get them ready. And that's that is that's real. She's still mad about it. Yeah. They seem super close out there. Well, because they they did this season right before it where they were out on an island as mentors, so they weren't competing and they were really just getting you know really getting to know each other. And we had already invited them both to play, but we never tell anybody mm -hmm. who's playing. So Sandra just volunteered. She said, hey, I'm coming back for 40, are you? And Rob said, no. Wow. And then he didn't tell her about Amber. Wow. So Sandra, in our interviews with her right before the show, you know, we, meet, we sit with you again just to talk. Yeah. And Sandra said, man, I'm so bummed that Rob is not playing. I thought it would have been so fun. And we're sitting there thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be a disaster. And <laughs> we just saw her the other night and she is, she's like, this is real. You didn't tell me the truth and she's out for, blood um by the way if you saw um we have another googler on this season um, who won previously the asian guy there yule yule kwan he's at google i think um i forget what office it's not san bruno uh, menlo park maybe probably the smartest guy number wise and that's ever played yeah so if you're not going to tune in for me not going to tune in for this guy tune in for yule and root him on. um so before q a um just what can we expect for 40. Uh, 40 is a war. We designed the whole thing. I mean, you think about all the little elements, which, you know, Google is amazing at how you guys brand. Winners at war was the first big decision. We wanted the players to know it's a war. Mm -hmm. It's not a celebration. It's a war. You're going to break, you're going to break the game. You're going to break yourselves and you're going to 
you know, break each other. And then out of the gate, right after that, we have this really big physical challenge and it's physical. And some of these people have not been in game mode for quite a while. We have a lot of moms that were maybe 25 when they first played and they were fit and rare, rare to go. Now they're like three kids and, and right away it's in the water and people are going at it. And that mindset is what continues throughout. And then there's this addition of the economy and I'm not the brightest guy with like, you know, math and stuff. And so I was trying to figure out, we were trying to figure out how's the economy going to work. If we're the federal reserve, mm -hmm. we have this much money we're going to put into this world. How much do we give the game and how do we make sure that money stays in the game enough so that there's an incentive to try to get all of it, but that you can't, you can't get so much that you can dictate the entire game. So we did a lot of math trying to figure out how that was gonna work. And then the other part of the equation was having edge of extinction be one part of supply and the game be the other part of demand. And both sides have what the other needs. And that's the biggest twist this season. And you'll see in the first episode, the players don't quite get it, but they know they have these tokens and they know something's up. And then there's an event that happens and somebody begins to realize this has to involve Edge of Extinction. This is gonna change the game completely. Really cool. Yeah, it's fun. Nice. First of all, thank you so much to you both for being here. I think I speak for all the Survivor fans. You are such a legend. Oh, thanks uh, for having you're me. You're a legend too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, honestly, it's surreal that you're here. Um, question for Dean outside of, I want you to introduce me to your casting person too, but, um, <laughs> but uh, when you left this season, did you feel like no regrets played the best game I could, or did you like overanalyze it the entire time? Mm -hmm. Like, do you still do that now? Uh, a little of both. Um, my my strategy going in was to lay low, be DK chilling, and then turn up at the end. Um, I think it, Joe Joe Anglin like always would say that like you can't like a horse race, you can't come out of the gates too strong. Wait till the end. That was my strategy. And could I have asked for a better execution of my strategy? Absolutely not. Like. To think like come on strong at the end, I had no idea it would entail what actually turned out to happen. So to have that explosive end, like no regrets, absolutely in my strategy. Um, however, like I remember right after final tribal council, like that next morning, the plane ride home, I have a whole notepad of like, gosh, when Tommy said this at final tribal, I should have said this and this and this and this. And then it kind of all came back to me at the finale there um, when Tommy was announced the winner and I was like, damn, but I don't know. No regrets. I mean, our brains are so mishmash at yeah. Final Tribal Council, and it's so long. Like, and you're getting beat up. Yeah. Everybody's hammering you. Yeah. But my favorite part of the season, it was you in this the very last episode when we had Rob and Sandra out there building this shelter. Part of the there were so many layers of the pitch to get Rob and Sandra to say yes. Starting with, we'll build a giant statue of you. No, the shelter. Yeah. 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 And that was the other pitch to Rob was he wanted to do a home remodeling show. And I said, well, how about this? We'll put you on this island and you'll build the biggest shelter in the history of Survivor. And he goes, all right, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna need. And he starts immediately going, I'm gonna need two shovels. I'm gonna need three hammers. Don't give me any of those cheap nails. Give me real stuff. <laughs> yeah, he built that. He can build. He can build, we just talked to him and he said, I can do anything on a renovation. I'll do every single thing in the house. He built it, he built this huge, he called it like moon, moon, moon view or something where they had a big net and they would just sit there and look yeah. at the stars at night. But the coolest part was that, do you guys know this guy, uh, the game Exploding Kittens? Yeah. Well, this guy, Elon Lee is like one of the smartest people I've ever met and he's a friend of mine. And, so I'll always call him and say, okay, here's what we're doing. What do you got? And he's this fast. He's like, okay, one thing you could do would be. So we were talking about this Island of the Idols and how life lessons. And then at the very end, they're going to come live the last few days out there and there'll be one final clue. And they're going to give them this cool buff and the buff is the clue, but hopefully we're going to design it in a way in which maybe only one person will realize it. I don't know. It's, a, it's just, you never know what's going to happen, but that's a big premise. And then he goes, you said Rob was gonna build a big shelter, right? And I said, yeah, and he said, what if the shelter is a massive escape room? And that's the final clue. So it was Alon Lee's idea, and then we just started executing, and then you are the one that, he gets the, he, Tommy figures it out, and you're the one that starts putting things, and there's a spot where you grab a machete, and you wedge this thing open, and you grab it, and you put it back. Watching that in the first cup, I was like, 
God, it's so cool to see this thing work. You, you were so zoned in on it, and then you didn't say a word. I thought, I thought it was my winning moment. But it's pretty good. Next time. Next, right here? Right here? Okay. Uh, thank you both so much for coming. Love the show. Um, watched every episode, every season. Me and my wife started dating in the summer of 2000, so it's been a staple of our relationship really? the entire time. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so th there's a couple... <laughs> There's a couple of things I've always wondered, uh, medical related. Um, so if people have like regular medications they take, is that allowed on the show? Right. And then also, what about sunscreen? Sunscreen, we give them. Okay. And it's reef safe. You know, it's very environmentally conscious, but we don't want them burning up. It's amazing how many people don't really use it. Did you use it? Oh, every day. Yeah. Okay. And then- Still got the best tan of my life though. Yeah, exactly. Even best when tan. you use it. Yeah. Um, medications, yes, you, in theory, Yes, you could have a daily medication. It would depend what the medication is. If it was something that you had to have or else you might be physically in trouble, then you probably wouldn't get on because mm -hmm. our, our doctors would say it's too big a risk. And if it was something that was giving you some kind of an advantage, then we probably wouldn't let you use it. So it's kind of a case by case basis. Medical marijuana? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it's not a bad reward idea though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we probably have like one or two more. I think. Where is it back there? Uh, you said you're a student of the human condition. <laughs> right. Uh, lofty words, I know. Lofty words. <laughs> uh, hopefully we all aspire to be students. Um, through these 20 years, what are one or two aspects of the human condition that um, really resonated or stuck with you through this process? It's a great question. Um, I'll just think of, I, I'll just riff on thoughts. But the first thing that goes through my head is that for the most part, I think we all think we're doing the right thing, which is why we can watch the show and go, why would you do that? Why would she say that? Don't you realize that's insulting? Or like when I said, you got swagger and he goes, thank you. You know, there'll be people at home going, oh my God, he doesn't even realize that was an insult. No, I didn't say it was an insult. That's you putting your judgment on me saying you got swagger that... So that's, that's one of the things that makes the show so cool is we all think we're right. And I think the other is what really drives me, or another one that really drives me is we are capable of so much more. We just don't apply ourselves. We don't either put ourselves in the situations or we're afraid to seek them out. But when you come on a show like Survivor and you have to jump off of a boat into the middle of an ocean with a bunch of strangers, and then you come up onto a beach with people you don't know, and then it starts to rain, which happens a lot on day one, and then you have to build a shelter, and then you're freezing and your clothes are wet. Do I take my, what, do I take my shirt off? I'm not super comfortable doing that. All of those things just get at who, who we are as humans, but the reason I continue to thrive for me emotionally is that I'm just watching us live. We're trying, you know, we're all seeking something. And the biggest thing personally is I know I thought I was the center of the universe in season one. I think I viewed the world only through my filters. How lucky I am that I get to do this show. How lucky I am. And through watching people play and realizing we're all trying to figure it out, I've, each season I feel like I mature a little more like I'm a work in progress for sure, but a little more understanding, man, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the center of the universe, but I'm a grain of sand on the earth. And I just gotta find my place. And I know it's made me more patient. I can listen to answers longer. You know, I don't feel like I have to jump in and have an opinion on things. And I don't know if that answers your question, but. Very much so, thank you. Cool, thanks. Uh, that's a deep question to follow, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the game is the evolution and the twists and how it changes every season. Are there any twists or changes that you were your favorites over the year that never made the show? None that didn't make it. None that didn't. Uh, there's a couple that we did that, uh, there's two that we did that I didn't like. <laughs> I'm realizing how this is gonna sound. They were, <laughs> neither of them were really ideas I wanted to do or my ideas, they were both Mark's. But um, look, he has, he's in the hall of fame. He can have some bad ideas, but one was, we did this thing where we brought back people, we called them the outcasts, and we voted people out. They went and went to a hotel and ate and had a shower, and then Mark said, we should just bring them back. That would blow their minds. And all of us were like, but that's fundamentally wrong. And we did it, and it was criticized, and I've said, like, man, I'm, I'm no genius. I didn't think it was a good idea. The other one was this idea called the Medallion of Power, which, oh my God. <laughs> And we toyed with this idea and it was called the Medallion of Power and we would jokingly go with the Medallion of Power, like we were rock stars. 
<laughs> but we're sitting at a table and and pitching the okay this is this is what we're going to lock in we've got a whiteboard we're going to start in three days what are we doing and the medallion of power was something we had all realized is really corny and super dumb but mark loved the name he's like i don't know medallion of power is i think we do it we just do it if it doesn't work it doesn't work but we, we, we do it and i'm looking across at somebody from cbs going you say something. I already said something. <laughs> you know? And we did it and we got mocked for it. And I still laugh about it because even the players were like, whoa, man, check this out, dude. It's called the Medallion of Power. I don't know what the hell it is. I don't want it. <laughs> but for the most part, here's how our, and I keep referencing you guys because I feel like Google is, the, it kind of embodies this idea, but we just try things. And as long as I'm, you know, blessed with being the showrunner, we're going to try things that I think are interesting or that I can see some path to get there, even if it's not my idea. If I can't see a path for me, we're not doing it because I have to be able to understand what it is. So whether it's Edge of, Edge of Extinction, Island of the Idols came from, Island of the Idols and Edge of Extinction both came from desperate nights of what are we going to do? And then Island of the Idols was, what if we made them gods? What if we had gods? Like, like, you know, Zeus. And that was the pitch. And I called our art guys and said, what if we had a Mount Rushmore and we made these giant heads? And they said, give us a day. And they called us back and they, he said, Zach and Dak said, ah, oh, man, we can't do that. It's just no way in the middle of the ocean to build what you want, but we can do really cool banners. And that was an unusual no from them. And I remember on the phone going, yeah, banners aren't going to cut it. <laughs> we should be able to do this. And then I didn't hear from them for like three weeks. And when they called back, they said, here's the plan. We're doing 3D photos. We've got a place in Australia that'll make the composites. We're going to ship them on a ferry across the ocean. We're going to build them on. It was already done. They had already figured out the entire thing. So, and when you see those ideas come to life and you look at your team, you know, and you feel, oh my God, we actually did this. Whether it works and it's a great season or whether you think it was terrible, it doesn't matter. It was still fulfilling an idea and it was a new season and it kept us alive to try something new. And maybe we'll do it again because I will tell you this, every player now wants a statue. <laughs> even, even in the first episode of this season, they go, well, look, let's be honest. Two people here have statues and that's the only two statues they've ever had. And then somebody goes, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we are at time, everybody. Can we uh, give it up for our man, Jeff Crow. Thank you, guys. I felt the love.